sex with underage girls. Tonight, some rich and powerful men face deeply unsavory criminal allegations involving sex crimes where the victims were either underage or virtually ignored. All these stories breaking late tonight. Trace Gallagher is on the case from our L.A. newsroom. Good evening, Mike. Weeks after his New England Patriots won their sixth Super Bowl, 77-year-old Robert Kraft is accused of paying for sexual acts at a day spa in Jupiter, Florida. The spa was part of a months-long sex trafficking investigation, though we should note Robert Kraft is not involved with sex trafficking. But police say they do have him on video receiving sexual acts. A Patriot spokesperson denies the allegations, and today President Trump said this. Watch. That's very sad. Uh, I I was very surprised to see it. Uh, he's proclaimed his innocence totally, and uh, but I'm very surprised to see it. Kraft is facing misdemeanors that rarely result in jail time, but R&B singer R. Kelly could be looking at 70 years in prison. Kelly, whose real name is Robert Kelly, was charged today with 10 counts of aggravated sexual abuse involving four victims, three of them between the ages of 13 and 17. Attorney Michael Avenatti, who represented porn star Stormy Daniels, says he gave Chicago prosecutors video evidence of Kelly having sex with a girl who says several times on tape that she's 14. Listen. Today marks a watershed moment in the 25 years of abuse by this predator known as R. Kelly. R. Kelly's attorneys say the allegations are blatantly false. Kelly was acquitted on child pornography charges in 2008. Meantime, Labor Secretary Alexander Acosta is back on the hot seat for a plea deal he struck a decade ago with billionaire sexual predator Jeffrey Epstein, who was accused of molesting 80 women and trafficking minors from overseas to perform at sex parties. Epstein was facing life in prison, but because of the plea agreement that Acosta, who was Miami's top prosecutors signed off on. Epstein ended up serving 13 months in the Palm Beach County Jail. The deal also gave his victims no recourse. But now a federal judge in Florida says the agreement was illegal, and some Democratic lawmakers want President Trump to demand Acosta's resignation. Mike. Trace Gallagher leading us off tonight. Trace, thanks a lot. Speaking of public scandals, mere hours before the General Assembly session ends, a new push by Republicans to investigate one of Virginia's top Democrats. Jillian Turner has the very latest on a controversy that almost got overshadowed and even forgotten. Jillian. It's been over two weeks since two women came forward to detail sexual assault allegations against Virginia's lieutenant governor, Justin Fairfax. The state's Republicans say until today there have been crickets from the Democrats. We tried to work diligently with our colleagues across the aisle to create a bipartisan way to investigate. We proposed a special subcommittee that would have been five, five, five Republicans, five Democrats to hear testimony, issue subpoenas, and conduct the investigation that was declined. But in a breakout move today, Republicans from the state's House of Delegates said time's up and announced a hearing. So I announced today, the Courts of Justice Committee will schedule a meeting where we will invite Dr. Tyson and Ms. Watson to testify. We will also be inviting Lieutenant Governor Fairfax to testify. This will give all parties a chance to be heard. Meredith Watson's attorney accepted immediately, saying, quote, she looks forward to testifying at this forum. And echoing a theme familiar from last year's confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh, added, quote, it is our understanding that the hearing will be public and televised and be subject to the same rules and requirements, including our right to present witnesses and corroborators. Watson claims Fairfax raped her while both were undergraduate students at Duke University nearly two decades ago. And Vanessa Tyson, professor at Scripps College in California, claims Fairfax sexually assaulted her in Boston during the Democratic National Convention of 2004. Both women have called for Fairfax to resign and have publicly indicated their desire to testify against him. The big question now is when. Republicans and the alleged victims are eager to get the ball rolling, and this year's General Assembly session ends tomorrow. However, Virginia's Constitution would allow lawmakers to return at a later date, especially to hold this hearing if that's what they choose to do. Mike? Julian, thanks very much. So much bad behavior, so little time. But we have cleared a good chunk of time here to discuss how the famous have fallen. Here now, Fox News contributors Jamu Green and Britt McHenry 
and former Virginia Congresswoman Barbara Comstock. Great to have you all. Hi, Mike. Jamu, should Virginia Democrats work with Republicans to investigate the sexual assault allegations against Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax to take partisanship out of it? Absolutely. There, there's no question about it. These issues should not be seen through a partisan lens. I think, sadly, that is what is going on. But the lack of an investigation for Lieutenant Governor Justin Fairfax is basically moral malpractice on the behalf of Democratic politicians. These scandals that we're seeing today, I mean, Mike, thank goodness it was National Margarita Day. <laughs> scandal after scandal after scandal. Can we start to finally talk about toxic masculinity, which I'm not saying is something that is about all men are bad, but it's about how manhood is defined by sex and violence and aggression. And I think that's really where we are right now in society. We have to address this. R. Kelly, so finally good to see him in handcuffs. The 25 years he has been doing this to young, black, vulnerable girls and the, complace, the, the contributions that the enablers made, his managers, the agents, the lawyers, they also need to be held accountable. Okay. The, the list goes on and on and on. Congresswoman, you have a background, a strong background in Virginia politics. You know a lot of these key players. Now they're going to bring in Lieutenant Governor Fairfax's accusers to testify. Your thoughts on where things stand right now? Well, I served in the State House also, and so I'd like to commend Speaker Kirk Cox for taking this action today. He was trying to work to have a bipartisan committee, 5 5, so any action would have to be bipartisan. And inexplicably, the Democrats refused to work with it. The Democrat um, women, actually, there's dozens of them down there who aren't doing anything. But I would like to point out, like Jamu, there are two um, Democrat men delegates who are saying they should go forward and this should be bipartisan because over the past year and a half as we worked on these Me Too issues in Congress and with Hollywood it was not about party it was about getting those who were in power misusing their power and getting them you know out of sure. wherever they were abusing people and to make it a level playing field and to allow victims to come forward we still have due process and that due process both in a legal system but also in a political open system so that's what they need to do um, with Justin Fairfax and it's really disgraceful that today you saw I was really disappointed to see one of my former colleagues in the State House Eileen Fillercorn the minority leader say oh we really can't do this right. of course they can do it and they should do it and Virginians deserve it and we need to hear from Justin Fairfax as well as these women who want to come forward Britt in your previous life you covered sports at the highest level yes. can you get your head around Robert Kraft the owner of the world champion Super Bowl champion New England Patriots getting involved with this <sighs> prostitution case in Florida he, you know, and I think the worst is still yet to come if you are to go by the reports by my former colleague, Adam Schefter, who said that we could have as much as 175 names still to come out, uh, reports that there's an even bigger name than his. And I think that, look, there's a lot of jokes going around on social media, but this is a serious thing. Sure. And the question will be, what knowledge, if any, did he have of potential sex trafficking, right? Because there were a couple locations in Florida, not just the particular massage parlor that he went to. Um, and so I think that a lot, of, a lot of NFL agents and players I spoke to were shocked that this is so out of the norm, especially they, they're just coming off the Super Bowl win, their sixth Super Bowl under uh, Kraft in the Bill Belichick era, that this would happen. But um, I don't think it's to be taken lightly at all. Briefly. Mike, I'd like to point out, um, I'm on the board of Just Ask Prevention on Human Trafficking. This is an issue we've worked on bipartisan. What they will tell you, officers involved in this, is when you are paying for sex in whatever situation it is, 80 percent of those vict of, of people are, are, in, are trafficked. So to say you don't know, this is a human trafficking sting the case that was involved. To say you don't know that, that is something that the public needs to understand because it's not just about prevention, it's about stopping those who are soliciting and engaging. And to say you're ignorant when we actually know that 80% of those people involved in any type of prostitution are trafficked, that is something that we have tried to educate the public on a bipartisan basis and have passed tougher human trafficking laws to deal with that reality. Britt, uh, no love lost we've between got... the commissioner and Robert Kraft. Yes. Um, consequences with the NFL. 
that is where if this doesn't go to a full extent legally where he really could get some pushback because Robert Kraft goes to every game. He goes to away games, he goes to the home games. It could be possibly a $500,000 fine and a six-game suspension for violating the uh, code of conduct for the league policy. And they, they def after the flake gate, there's some bad blood sure. between those two. So I could see Roger Goodell trying to flex some muscles. Giants fan, for those of you scoring at home, Jamu. <laughs> Let me read you this tweet from writer Matt Walsh, who wrote, Smollett staged a hate crime, yet still has a job. Northam wore blackface and advocated infanticide, yet still has a job. Fairfax was credibly accused of rape by two women, yet still has a job. Don't tell me about privilege. No one is more privileged in modern America than a leftist. Your reaction to that, Jammu? Like I said, this should not be looked at through a partisan lens especially when you know at one point there were no less than three stories on the home page of the new york times about sexual abuse and sexual exploitation robert Kraft, the catholic church r kelly i certainly think that jesse smollett should be thrown under the jail he has planted seeds of hate that are going to grow exponentially and there are many people on the left who recognize that who have condemned it just like we have with R. Kelly, and we should in use, they also have to have some accountability here. All right, we have to leave it there. Jammu, Britt, <laughs> Congresswoman, thanks so much. Thank you. The president says it's more than likely that a deal will happen in trade negotiations with China. This just days before traveling to Vietnam for a second summit with Kim Jong-un. Leland Vitter tells us what the president has planned. Good evening, Leland. Now, evening, Mike. Tonight and over the weekend, the first major wave of administration officials heads west towards Vietnam. But they go having left expectations slightly, but not much, above calling it just a photo op. Here is Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The good news is, is they haven't conducted uh, missile tests or nuclear tests in now well over a year. Uh, so that's better than the place that we found it when the Trump administration came into office. Uh, but as the president said yesterday, and as the administration has said repeatedly, uh, this is a long and difficult task. During a meeting with the Chinese vice premier, President Trump struck a more optimistic tone and said everything was on the table. He appeared positive about his foreign policy, calling a trade deal with the Chinese very likely ahead of a March 1st deadline for more tariffs. That optimism sent the Dow for its first close above 26,000 in three months. And the president said he would continue to count on the Chinese for their help with the North Koreans. Let's look at the promises coming out of last year's joint statement at the first meeting with Kim Jong-un. Peaceful relations, the recovery of U.S. troops remains, follow-up talks, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. As for a report card, CIA Director Gina Haspel accused Pyongyang of being committed to, quote, developing a long-range nuclear-armed missile that would pose a direct threat to the United States, a view perhaps a little different than her bosses. We've had a great relationship. Uh, the Singapore was a tremendous success. Only the fake news likes to portray it otherwise. We would have gone, we would have been, we would have literally been in a war with North Korea, in my opinion, had I not been elected. Well, now, ahead of the trip, there is a growing chorus of questions if the president is willing to give up too much and receive too little from Kim Jong un. Here's Jeff Mason of Reuters already declaring Kim Jong un a winner. The fact that that summit is happening at all is a win for the North Korean leader. Uh, U.S. officials have been playing down expectations of what's going to happen there, and that alone is, is good for him. Well, what makes this summit so unusual is just like the last one, very little is agreed on by both sides ahead of time. And whatever relationships were built by the United States representatives with their counterparts at the last meeting there in Singapore and in the meantime might go to waste. Kim Jong-un, Mike, just replaced much of his nuclear negotiating team. Leland, of course, the president announced his next pick for U.N. ambassador today. What do you make of the timing? Well, noteworthy in the sense that it wasn't a big rollout. Happened late Friday afternoon. Kelly Knight Craft is currently ambassador to Canada, and if confirmed, will take over at the U.N. Very noteworthy, the president picked someone who had already gone through the Senate confirmation process and also comes from Mitch McConnell's home state. Mike. Leland Vitter, live tonight in Washington. Leland, thanks so much.
Stick with Fox News for live round the clock coverage of the second U.S. North Korea summit. It all happens in Hanoi next Wednesday, Thursday, Vietnam time, which means that our coverage here on Fox News at night begins Tuesday night. Shannon Bream will be right here as the president and Kim Jong un go face to face again. And we'll have an extended show from 11 to 1 a.m. Eastern time on Tuesday and Wednesday night. Don't miss it. Progressives, including Senator Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren, among those supporting reparations for slavery. Can that policy go the distance in the 2020 campaign? And Senator Bernie Sanders fires back at Democrats worried about his age, race, and gender. Now, I think we have got to try to move us toward a, a non-discriminatory society which looks at people based on their abilities. David Spunt joins us now with the 2020 candidate and how he is handling the criticism. Hi, David. Yeah, hey, Mike, good to be with you. Well, listen, Bernie Sanders is a second time arounder for a presidential campaign, and he's going to benefit from name recognition in the 2020 race. But with the rise of identity politics, he's becoming a target of race and gender recognition, and he's pushing back on critics. But Sanders is a 77-year-old white male in a Democratic field that's shaping up to be younger and more divorced than ever before. Sanders himself discusses diversity and how it should play into the Democratic nomination for president. This issue of identity politics is getting play where most of the candidates are making stops. The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, who poked fun at Sanders after his announcement this week. But Sanders, for all that diversity... Bernie Sanders does not believe that hurts his chances. We have got to look at candidates, not by the color of their skin, not by their sexual orientation or their gender, and not by their age. I mean, I think we have got to try to move us toward a, a non-discriminatory society which looks at people based on their abilities, based on what they stand for. Yes, like Dr. King, I have a dream, a dream where this diverse nation can come together and be led by an old white guy. <laughs> The Sanders criticism doesn't ring hollow with Sanders himself, who was criticized for running a 2016 campaign that was not diverse enough. Here he is last night responding to that claim. When people said that our campaign was too white, too male oriented, they are right. You take a look at the uh, staff that we are putting together right now. Take a look at who our national co-chairs are. You will see a fundamental difference in the way our campaign is operating. And identity politics becoming more obvious during this campaign because of the diversity we're seeing. So says former Georgia House Minority Leader Stacey Abrams, who lost her bid for governor. And similar comments tonight from Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. She was in New Hampshire. What I would tell every single candidate is that pay attention to identity. Talk about it, but talk about it in the context of your larger policies. Electing more women, putting more women in positions of power, from committee rooms to boardrooms to that really nice oval-shaped room at 1600 Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. It's time. All right, Howard Schultz, who's not a politician, he may be running as an independent. He described himself as not seeing color when asked about race. But, Mike, he's been criticized by many pundits on the left for such comments. Interesting story, identity politics, something it seems like we'll be seeing as we get closer to 2020. No question, and it's only February 2019. <laughs> yeah, really, How right, about a, couple, a little while away. David Spunt, thanks a lot. Sure. An illustration tonight of just how far left some Democratic presidential candidates seem willing to go to get the nomination. At least three of them are now supporting a position former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and former President Barack Obama would not take, reparations for African Americans. Here's correspondent Doug McKelway. The idea of reparations occasionally arises as a way to right America's historical wrong of slavery. But it's getting the attention of some presidential candidates Look, now. That we have got to address that, um, again, it's back to the inequities. After Democratic Senator Kamala Harris threw her support behind reparations last week, two other Democratic candidates jumped on board yesterday. I have long thought that this country would be better off if we did find a way to do that. Senator Elizabeth Warren said, quote, we must confront the dark history of slavery and government sanctioned discrimination. Civil rights activist Robert Woodson says the sudden reparations push is shameless pandering. I find it insulting that I'd rather face an honest bigot than a social justice warrior. Woodson believes the real reason behind the move is that President Trump is pulling some of the African-American vote away from the Democratic Party. African-American unemployment is at an all-time low, historic low. 
While polls show only 7% of African-American voters support the president, Woodson believes it's higher. Well, absolutely. About 19% of, uh, of blacks support Donald Trump. These are concrete steps that this administration is taking that if it's done the right way, it can really convert Democratic voters into swing voters. He cites opportunity zones and sentencing reform as well as the low unemployment rate. Supporting reparations may be a risky strategy for all three candidates given the divisiveness over the issue. One 2016 Marist survey found that only 32 percent of African Americans were opposed to it, but 85 percent of white residents were. None of the other Democratic contenders have weighed in on reparations. During his 2016 campaign, Senator Bernie Sanders dismissed it, telling an interviewer, quote, its likelihood of getting through Congress is nil. None in the 2020 field have offered details, for example, how to divvy up reparations among mixed race people or how to handle the groundswell of opposition that will surely follow. Mike? Doug McKelway in Washington tonight. Doug, thanks a lot. How do top Democrats suddenly embrace reparations for slavery? Our power panel is here to weigh in. Zach Friend, Tom Bevan, and Kurt Schen. At least three of them are now supporting a position Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama would not take reparations for African Americans. With that, let's bring in our panel, Democratic strategist Zach, Fr Zach Friend, the president and co-founder of Real Clear Politics, Tom Bevan, and a senior columnist at townhall.com, Kurt Schlichter. Gentlemen, great to have you. Good, Good to, to be, be here. here. Zach, I'm going to play this sound from Senator Kamala Harris, and I'll ask you to react to it. So when we're talking about recognizing the inequalities, the inequities, it's not about saying I'm trying to take from those who have achieved success if they've played by the rules and worked hard. Good for you. Keep it. But I am saying we need to be honest and address that not everyone has an equal opportunity Absolutely. to access to success. And we've got to address that. So, Zach, is a trillion dollars or more to the African-American community the way to go? Well, I think a, a couple things on this. I, I happen to know Senator Harris personally, and she definitely is a social justice person, and I'm not surprised that this is a position that she's taking. But I think that overall, uh, issues like this are going to continue to come up in a Democratic primary when you don't have a clear front runner. Right. Uh, and these kinds of issues, I mean, similar in 2016 when you had 17 Republicans running, one of the ways that the now President Trump really differentiated himself was by taking, I think, what a lot of the Republican establishment would have said were pretty controversial stands on immigration. So too, I think in the Democratic primary, you're going to have some stances that maybe don't uh, jive with a lot of the uh, general election voters in the Democratic base. And so I think that there's going to be some stuff coming up over the next month or two months that will be having the same conversation. Well, Senator Harris is not alone. Take a listen to Senator Elizabeth Warren tonight in Manchester, New Hampshire. Tom, is there a fear of being seen as a moderate if you're not all in on these liberal ideas? Well, certainly the, that's where the, the energy is on the, on the Democratic side, is, is pulling everybody leftward. I mean, but, but this is an issue that is, is terribly unpopular in the mainstream of the country. And, and this is one that's going to be hard for Democrats who go on record supporting something like this to come back in a general election and sort of a position they're going to climb down from. And I always take these issues and look at them. This election is going to boil down to about seven states. All the rest are already pretty much decided. And you're talking about, so how do all these various issues, including this one, play in places like Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida? I mean, that's where it's going to matter. And it's not a popular position. So I think this is a real problem for Democrats. The National Review is seeing politics here writing, quote, the proposals are not intended to mitigate evil. They are intended to make Elizabeth Warren or Kamala Harris or Kirsten Gillibrand president of the United States. Kurt, your reaction. Oh, well, look, I couldn't support this more. I'm a conservative. I want the Republican to win. And Tom's absolutely right. This kind of moral idiocy is poison in the swing states. I mean, I want to see these guys go into Ohio saying, hey, guys, everybody, reparations. That's the real issue, not the economy. 
not getting your kids out of endless wars, reparations. But Mike, I'm still puzzled. How does this work? I, I, my beautiful wife uh, escaped from the Democrats' favorite communist hellhole, Cuba. How much does she owe? And, and my great great grandfather, he fought with the Union Army. Do I get a discount? How does this work? It's stupid. It's immoral. And I want the Democrats to keep doing it and self destruct. Zach, all indications are this is going to be a really crowded field, which we expect to maybe up to 25 or so candidates. Is the critical thing to make sure a chunk of the left base is fired up about you? Well, we have an exceptionally fired up base. If you think about the 2016, excuse me, 2018 midterm elections, it was clear that there were a lot of new voters turning out. However, the, the reason the Democrats won the House were actually in some of these suburban swing districts that actually do not have the same type of fired up base that some of these other districts had. So I agree with Tom in the sense that you're going to have to find a way uh, to parse that difference, to actually win through the industrial Midwest. Ultimately, in 2020, the election still will be won in the states that are always the swing states over the last 20 years. Tom, what do Vice President Biden and Senator Sherrod Brown, the folks who could play well with those white working class voters, do? Do they jump on the repatriation or reparations bandwagon or do they stay out of it? Well, well, we'll have to see. I mean, I think Sherrod Brown has been sort of cautious in, in some of these positions, Medicare for all, etc. And he talks about it in terms of, you know, he wants to be able, he wants to be practical and get things that, and Amy Klobuchar says the same thing. He, she uh, doesn't want pie in the sky. She wants things that can actually be achieved in the short term. Certainly reparations is not one of those things. So, you know, the Democrats are in a dilemma here because privately you will hear Democrats say we need a white male to win the 2020 election. Publicly, though, they're not saying that. And in fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. People are looking toward, uh, you know, females, persons of color. Those are sort of the, the cachet for Democrats. Uh, who are running in this in this primary election. So it's a real dilemma for Democrats, I think, come the general election. Kurt, how alarmed do you think some of these white male potential candidates are at this point? You heard Bernie Sanders complain about it, but you have maybe Joe Biden, Senator Sherrod Brown. Um, should they be alarmed that this may not be the year for a Democrat white male? I, I, I think they should, because the Democrat Party is completely obsessed with race. Now, I want it to be, because I want them to lose. And here's the dirty little secret about Republicans. You get us a conservative, we'll happily vote for a differently abled lesbian Hindu of color if that person is going to support a strong military, a strong economy, the first, second, and even third amendments. We're looking for values. They're looking for a check in the box. And okay. that's why they're going to lose next year. Gentlemen, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Up next, President Trump comes out swinging against Planned Parenthood, cutting off millions in funding and steering it instead to anti war That plume of smoke, you can see uh, one of the IDF military vehicles. And right now, uh, we have a, a number of IDF troops uh, that are asking our crew to leave this area. Uh, there's concern of not only uh, shooters along the border, but also uh, snipers from Hamas positions inside the Gaza Strip that could be firing at our crew right here. Uh, so I'm going to toss it back to you. Fox News correspondent Trey Yingst along the Israel-Gaza border. The Trump administration issuing new regulations governing the Title X family planning program today. The biggest takeaway being a financial and physical separation for funding from programs and facilities where a president who respects them. Meanwhile, the democratically controlled legislatures in several other states are working to change the way a president is elected in a fundamental way. One of the states, Colorado. Our Alicia Cunha has the details from Denver. Colorado's democratically controlled legislature voted this week to join the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which claims it, quote, would ensure that every vote will be equal throughout the U.S. and that every vote in every state will matter in every presidential election. States that join agree to award their electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote, regardless of their own state's results. The movement got its start after the 2000 election when Al Gore won the popular vote, but George W. Bush won the electoral college. College. It gained steam after it happened again to Hillary Clinton in 2016. Backers need states totaling 270 electorals to join, the amount to win the presidency. Right now, 11 states in the District of Columbia belong, with Colorado's Democratic Governor Jared Polis's signature expected to add the state's nine votes. 
all places Clinton won. With Colorado, organizers need just 89 more electoral votes. And honestly, that would take some red states doing it. Critics say this is an end run around the U.S. Constitution. Uh, this is not something where the state legislatures independently via compact can come together and modify the federal constitution. Article 4 says how states can join the union, and so states still have to abide by our supreme law of the land, which is the U.S. federal constitution. Supporters say it evens the playing field for voters, pointing out the majority of campaign events in 2016 took place in just a dozen battlegrounds. Why do 12 states get to pick the president, right? So that's what's happening now. But those opposed worry candidates would primarily visit states with big populations. And so this would be taking away your and my vote and saying, let's let someone else in another state decide what Colorado is going to do. A Pew Research poll last year showed a majority of Americans supported changing the Constitution to get rid of the Electoral College. The National Popular Vote Compact would not change the Constitution and it would not get rid of the Electoral College. That would take action from Congress. Mike. Alicia Cunha in Denver tonight. Alicia, thanks. A Christian adoption agency is suing New York after the state claiming discrimination tries to shut down the agency for refusing to place children with unmarried or same-sex couples. Does the adoption agency shut them down because they held to their religious convictions? New Hope Family Services says the state threatened to close the agency for what the state deemed to be a discriminatory and impermissible policy of referring unmarried or same-sex couples to other adoption agencies because of its religious beliefs. But the state argues granting the agency an exemption would violate the constitutional constitution's equal protection clause. Tonight's Legal Eagles, employment discrimination attorney Marjorie Mesdor and white collar crime and securities attorney Andrew Stoltman. Good evening. Great to have you. Good evening. Okay, so Exhibit A, let's take a listen to President Trump. My administration is working to ensure that faith-based adoption agencies are able to help vulnerable children find their forever families while following their deeply held beliefs. Marjorie, why shouldn't it be possible to have a Christian adoption agency or some other faith background having an adoption agency of its own? Well, essentially, for a faith-based organization who is doing the job that is not related to the practice of their religion, um, to openly discriminate against something that clearly states in the guidelines that either marital status and sexual orientation cannot be taken into consideration in and of itself is a violation of the law. Um, I think that it's very clear on its face and it is clearly impermissible. Um, ultimately, this is not something that is prohibiting them from practicing their faith or practicing their religion, but they are partaking in adoption and there is nothing religious in the processing of adoption of children. My understanding is that a lot of birth mothers like to know what background their children may be going to, um, and so some may prefer a Christian or a Jewish or a Muslim agency. What's wrong with that? Well, that in and of itself, there isn't anything wrong with that for the natural parents to have a preference one way or the other. But what we're talking about is something a little bit different. You're talking about an agency that has a written policy that indicates that they will not in any way whatsoever uh, process adoption application for either a same-sex couple or somebody who's single. That's very different than a natural parent indicating a preference of whom they would like to adopt their child in order for there to be a preferable match. All right, let's go to Exhibit B. New Hope says New York law expressly permits birth parents to specify the religion of the adoptive family with which their child will be placed, and many birth mothers and adoptive parents choose to work with New Hope precisely because they share or value its religious nature and convictions. So your argument against them? Well, essentially, if the parent has indicated a particular preference, that's one thing. But New Hope has gone a step, a step above and beyond. They've indicated that they would not even allow a same-sex couple or a single person to even apply. That's regardless of the stated interest or the stated preference of the natural parent. If we have a situation where you have a natural parent who has specifically indicated, I would like my child placed 
in a Christian home with a, a, a natural okay. mother and a natural father, that's one thing. But this is clearly different than what's being asked. All right, let's bring Andrew into the conversation. Andrew, give us your take from where you sit in terms of your legal argument. Mike, it's stupid. It's imbecilic. It's probably the worst idea since the Ford Pinto, okay? You have an adoption agency that has done amazing work. They've placed a 1,000 kids in various homes in the last 40 years. They don't take a dime of taxpayer money. Nobody has complained. Nobody has complained about what they've done in the last 40 years. This is New York looking for a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. And I have a little bit of advice for New York. Instead of focusing in on something like this and an agency like this that's doing great work instead why don't you focus in on your crumbling infrastructure the murder the guns and you're chasing companies like and tonight will take on issues that are under covered by most in the media our first tonight how the press is responding to Jesse Smollett's fake hate crime we'll also get to the bottom of the question of hate hoaxes are they exceedingly rare as the New York Times told us this morning or are they pretty common it's just ahead. But first, we've got an update for you, a very uh, up-to-the-moment update on the Smollett case itself. Matt Finn joins us tonight from Chicago. Matt? Good evening, Tucker. Well, the update in the Smollett case, just they seem to be getting worse. This evening, Jesse Smollett's character on the show Empire has been officially cut for the rest of the season. The executive producers of the show say they consider Smollett a family member, but the past couple of weeks have been very emotional, and they wrote in a statement, quote, while these allegations are very disturbing, we are placing our trust in the legal system as the process plays out. We are also aware of the effects of this process on the cast and crew members who work on our show and to avoid further disruption on set released a statement quote we witnessed an organized law enforcement spectacle that has no place in the American legal system the presumption of innocence a bedrock in the search for justice was trampled upon at the expense of Mr. Smollett in a packed courtroom Jussie's attorney argued he's innocent is still backed by the Fox studio and is involved with charities the judge, however, publicly chastised Smollett, saying if the part about the noose is true and the alleged hoax, it's outrageous because it conjures up the most evil part of this country's history. Chicago's top cop also blasted Smollett. I'm left hanging my head and asking why. Why would anyone, especially an African-American man, use the symbolism of a noose to make false accusations? Smollett faces up to three years in jail for the false police report, and he's facing more serious federal charges. The FBI confirms to Fox News it is investigating that death threat letter with a MAGA return address. Chicago police now say Smollett sent that letter to himself a week before the attack. If convicted on mail fraud, Smollett could spend five to ten years in prison. And Tucker, lots of people weighing in all week about this Smollett case, and now even more people weighing in on the news tonight that R. Kelly faces more sexual assault allegations. So on a somewhat lighter note, NBA great Charles Barkley on his show was just flabbergasted and could not contain his laughter about the allegation that Jesse Smollett used a check to pay his friends to carry out this hoax. Do not commit crimes with checks. <laughs> Come on, man. You cannot. If you're going to break the law, do not write a check. And on that note, I will send it back to you, Tucker. It's great advice. Putting that on my fridge. Matt Finn from Chicago. Thank you. Well, when Jesse Smollett's hoax was still being investigated by the police, the New York Times and other media outlets suggested that it was a, quote, conspiracy theory to suspect that his claims might not be true. The message was, shut up and believe it, or else you're a bad person, if not clinically insane. Now, as is so often the case, the few people who are willing to think for themselves turned out to be absolutely right. And the press is scrambling to explain how exactly did that happen? How could reporters who were literally paid to be skeptical have fallen for such an obvious lie? It's not an easy question to answer. It's far easier just to pretend the whole thing never happened, and that's what some are doing. Jeff Bezos' Washington Post, for example, carries the almost amusingly pompous slogan, democracy dies in darkness. It's right on the masthead. And yet, just yesterday, the Post did its best to add to that darkness. The newspaper refused to run a single news story about Jesse Smollett's hoax. If you got your news from the Washington Post, you would still believe that Smollett was attacked by white racists for the crime of opposing Donald Trump. 
MSNBC did pretty much the same thing. Once Smollett was arrested, the channel did not even cover the story in primetime. Other journalists have decided that Smollett